Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 25 and reading through verse 37. I want to talk to us today on the topic, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Luke 20, 10, 25 through 37, and there it is on the screen behind me. And the word of the Lord reads today in the King James text. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he, meaning Jesus, said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Amen. Won't you be my neighbor? Will you bow your heads with me one more time? King Jesus, Master, Creator of the universe, God of all that live, we ask today, God, in the precious name of Jesus, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon the messenger of God. The Word of God is so important to our lives, and yet, Lord, the Word of God can be used as a weapon of destruction, not just a tool of construction. When it's placed in the feckless hands of men who would destroy rather than build, when it is preached from one's own imagination rather than in response to a word that is received from heaven, for we know, God, today that you're a constructive God. You're a healing God. You're a delivering God. You're a saving God. Lord, you send forth your word to heal and to help, to save and to deliver. And today it is my desire above all else that you would use me as your vessel that I might deliver to the people of God that word which you've placed in my heart for this moment in time, a word that is able to build up that which is broken, to bind up that which today is wounded, to heal that today, God, which is ill, 
to save that which is lost, to restore that master which has been separated and set aside. Master, anoint the ear of every hearer. Allow us today to have open ears, open hearing, open hearts, to receive from the Word of God that that Word preached might do what you would have it to do, that it might bring today hope and faith. Oh, Master, we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Won't you be my neighbor? You'll notice today the illustration I have behind my head is a picture of that famous television character, or I should say television personality, Mr. Fred Rogers. Recently there was a movie made of Mr. Rogers and he became quite a famous individual back in the 60s, 70s, 80s on television as he produced and starred in a television program that was designed for children. Many do not know, but Fred Rogers was also an ordained Presbyterian minister. And Mr. Rogers had a very soft-spoken, very gentle mannerism and a very gentle way about him. And Mr. Rogers' entire program was about educating and teaching children to have the right spirit and the right attitude and to, to be of such a mannerism as to be good neighbors, amen, and good citizens. And his show was extremely popular, and children loved Mr. Rogers. They loved the various characters that were part of Mr. Rogers' world, the mailman. Then, of course, there were the puppet characters, the king. He had his little trolley that uh, went around on a track, you know. And the children loved Mr. Rogers, but as part of the little song that Mr. Rogers would sing, he would ask the question, Won't you be my neighbor? As is so often the case in our primary text today, a certain man who had studied the law. Now I want you to understand, when the Word of God speaks of a lawyer, they're not talking about someone who had studied uh, secular law, but rather one who had studied and searched the law of Moses, which God had given to the people of Israel for the benefit of their fledgling nation. They were experts on all things regarding the law of Moses. And a certain lawyer stood up and tempted the Lord, saying, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, it's funny. You think people are always out to trip you up. You think people are always looking to trip you up. Listen, they did it to Jesus, they'll do it to you. There were people who'd asked the Lord questions, and they were just absolutely certain that they were going to be able to trip the Lord up. Excuse me a moment. Amen. And this was the case with this lawyer. He thought for certain Jesus would answer something that he then would be able to challenge him with and go after him with and suggest that somehow the Lord had compromised the law which God had given the people of Israel through the prophet and leader Moses. But Jesus answered and said, What is written in the law? Now listen to this. This is important. He said, What is written in the law? Then three words. How readest thou? Don't you know everybody that reads the same law doesn't understand it to say the same thing? Hello now. Mm -hmm. Amen. Did you hear me now? 
I can get the Bible to two different Christians and have them read a passage and ask them, how readest thou? And I'm going to get different responses. Christian people, or people I should say who identify as Christian, will point to the same identical portion of Scripture and yet they'll both have completely opposite standpoints on any given topic or any given subject. Am I telling the truth? This is why I try to tell LGBT believers, and not just LGBT, but all believers today, don't you worry when somebody comes after you and tries to use the Word of God to condemn you or to criticize you or to come after you. It's only their reading. It's only how they read it. It's only how they choose to understand it. If you allow somebody to chase you out of the faith because of their reading of God's Word, you're the fool, not them. Did you hear what I said today, folks? You're the one who's foolish. If you allow someone to chase you out of the kingdom of God because of the way they read the scriptures, then you are the one who is foolish, not them. Wonder how there will be those in eternity who are lost, who on judgment day are going to be pointing at other believers and other Christians within the church and making the accusation. But Lord, they pushed me out. Lord, they caused me to backslide. Lord, they put a stumbling block in front of my feet. And Jesus is going to look at them and answer, but how did you read it? I'm serving the Lord today. I'm living for God today. I'm in church today. I'm preaching the gospel today. After years and years and years of living under a cloud of guilt and shame, after years and years and years of believing what preachers said about LGBT people, what preachers and prophets and priests and popes have to say about LGBT people and their chances of making heaven. I'm preaching the gospel today. I'm living for the Lord today because God spoke to me. And you know what the Lord said to me? He didn't say to me, uh, you, you read that wrong. He said to me, read it again. Tommy, that's all the Lord said to me. I remember God trying to work on my heart and bring me to an understanding of things that would help me to be restored to my place in the kingdom of God and in the church of God. And I remember the Lord trying to talk to me and I would say, Lord, but Lord, I know what the book says. I know what the book says. I know what the book says. I'm condemned. I'm hell bound. I'm an abomination. I'm unclean and all these things. And the Lord simply said to me, Charles, read it again. He never said to me, you misunderstood it. He never said to me, you misread it. He said, read it again. After years and years of God struggling with me, I finally went back to passages which, to be frank, I had been terrified of for many years. Passages that scared me. Passages that I was convinced I understood as good or better than anybody on this planet. I went back to Genesis 19 and read the story of Abraham and, I mean, excuse me, of Lot and his wife and daughters leaving the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and their sister cities. I went back and God said to me, now when you read it this time, I want you to do something. I want you to put everything you've been taught, everything that's been told you, I want you to put all of that out of your mind for a moment and I want you to read it as if you never before ever had read it. I said, okay, well, that's not easy to do. But I read it again, and I tried to put aside every thought and every prejudice 
And every preconceived idea, notion that I had ever been taught or that had ever been preached at me, I put all that aside and I read it again. And all of a sudden I'm reading that and all of a sudden there's stuff popping up in me. There are things that just don't make any sense. Things that just started to cause me to wonder, well, wait a minute, if, if this is the case, then how, how can what they told me growing up as a kid be true? How can Sodom and Gomorrah be homosexual cities when Lot's there with his wife and two daughters and his two son-in-laws? Where do those son-in-laws come from if this is homosexual cities? Where do those son-in-laws come from? There's an awful lot of heterosexual people that live in a homosexual community. You hear what I'm telling you now? And I begin to read different things. And then I said, well, now, what, what? and then for the first time in my life, I was encouraged because of the questions I began to have. I was encouraged to go back to the original text, the original Hebrew, and research the original text. And I began to do that. And as I began to do that, I, my eyes were opened. All of a sudden, I began to realize, dear God, the way this thing has been preached at me my entire life is wrong. It is flat out wrong. This story's not even beginning to say what I've been told it says. And folks, I'm here to challenge you today. I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to challenge you. Get in the Word of God, do some research, put a little bit of work in, and you'll find the same things that I found. What we are told and what has been taught us is not always accurate or true. There are beliefs which become part of orthodoxy which are incorrect and inaccurate. And just because these beliefs have been held for decades or centuries or even millennium, it does not make them right, nor does it make them accurate. And Tommy, as I began to read and study and go back into the original Hebrew, I found out that a whole lot of things I'd read all my life, I had read and never understood correctly. And Jesus asked this lawyer, what does the law say? But then he added, how readest thou? Not just what does it say, but what does it say to you? Because what it says to you may not be what it says to someone else. So the man approaches things from a fairly safe place. And he quotes one major text from the law. Said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Now we know in another place that Jesus once quoted this very passage, and he said, Herein lies all the law and the prophets. So Jesus has told us in the Word of God that this passage literally capsulizes all of the law in its entirety. So there couldn't have been a safer answer for this lawyer to give than this one passage. See, he didn't go into, well, I can't commit adultery, I can't do this, I can't do that. He didn't go into all the rules and regulation, but instead he went for that one passage that literally... Uh, kind of compacts and puts all of the law and the prophets into one simple phrase. And he quotes that to the Lord, and the Lord said, Yeah, yeah, good answer, good answer. Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Now, the lawyer just got his question answered. That isn't good enough because he thinks he's going to outsmart Jesus. He thinks he's going to be able to push the Lord into a corner and cause him to say something he ought not to have said. Listen, but he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Do we ever think about, the, I'm telling you, when we read passages, it's amazing how we just read right over stuff. 
and we don't really think about what's being said. What the lawyer is about to say to the Lord, he says, according to the Word of God, in our primary text today, Luke chapter 10, he says with the intent of justifying himself. So obviously what he's about to say to the Lord is an area where he doesn't do things quite right. He's not loving the Lord as God with all his heart, with all his might, with all his mind, with all his soul. He's not loving his neighbor as himself. Uh, more specifically, he's not loving his neighbor as himself. How do I know this? Because it starts out by saying, but he willing to justify himself. Well, what's the question that he asks? He asks the question, and who is my neighbor? So that tells you right there, if he's asking this question to justify himself, then he's got a problem in the area of how he deals with his neighbor. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Sometimes, folks, if you just read the sentence and breeze over stuff, you lose out on a whole lot of meaning. This lawyer had an issue with love your neighbor as yourself. That, that passage, that part of the passage didn't quite settle with him too well. How many Christians in our world today don't much care for you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself? I got a queer neighbor. I got a drunk neighbor. I got a neighbor who's a prostitute. I've got neighbors who are divorced and remarried half a dozen times. I've got neighbors who are like this. I've got neighbors who are Mormons or John Jehovah's Witness, or I've got neighbors who do this or do that. I don't quite agree with what the Word of God said about loving my neighbor as myself. So in an effort to justify myself, like this lawyer, I asked the Lord, well, Lord, who then is my neighbor? Aha. Uh -huh. From the perspective of the law, listen to me carefully, children, because you're going to see that probably you've never read this passage right in your entire life. I love to do this. I love when God gives me something and it just kind of blows away all our past understanding and our past uh, viewpoint on things. As the lawyer asks this question, and who is my neighbor? What he's expecting the Lord to do now is to articulate and to demonstrate to him how we identify our neighbor. Doesn't that make sense? Who is our neighbor? Well, your neighbor is the person who lives right. Your neighbor is the person who lives within so many feet of you. Your neighbor, you know, he's expecting the Lord to articulate some specification at, that would help to identify who a neighbor is. You see, I don't have to love the guy who lives two blocks down the road because, after all, he's not my neighbor. My neighbor is only, according to Jesus, the one who lives directly beside me. Do you follow what I'm saying? My neighbor, according to Jesus, is only the one who, like me, lives according to the law. My neighbor, according to Jesus, is like me, that person who is heterosexual. My neighbor is that person, like me, who embraces a certain moral code or a certain moral standard of living. But the Lord's answer, as almost all of his answers are, turns the tables. Listen. Listen to the Lord's answer. Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came by, came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, 
came where he was, and when he saw him, he, excuse me, and likewise the Levite, go back to verse 32, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, verse 33, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and bound up his wounds, so on and so forth. Verse 36, which now of these three The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan. Thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Well, wait a minute. Most people read this story and they identify it as expounding the notion that the man who was beaten and the man who was robbed was the neighbor. And therefore, the Samaritan, what we often refer to as the Good Samaritan, ministered to this man because this man qualified as his neighbor. Isn't that how we mostly read it? But listen, let's look at it. Jesus didn't ask him whose neighbor was this broken man, this hurt man? Who, who, whose neighbor was he? No. He said out of these three that were journeying on a road between Jerusalem and Jericho. Now if you're journeying on a road, that tells you something right there. It tells you, number one, you ain't home. So your neighbor isn't who lives next to you. We know that right off the cuff. Hello now, am I telling the truth? They're journeying on our... Well, now the first man is a religious man, a devout man, a leader. Oh, I'm going to tell you, if you think leaders in the church live this thing simply because they're in a place of leadership, you're a fool. If you think just because he's a pastor, if you think just because he's a television preacher, if you think just because he's a priest, if you think because he calls himself apostle or he calls himself prophet, that that person is a man or woman of God, you are out of your mind. You are out of your mind. This priest walks by, sees the broken man, sees the robbed man, sees the wounded man left to die, keeps on walking. Then there comes another who's a Levite. Listen, a Levite is someone who is born into a position of ministry. This is someone who has the call of God on their life from the moment they breathe their first breath. There are people out there that have genuine callings on their life. I can tell you, I'm not the best preacher in the world, and I know it. And I'm not saying that out of false modesty. I'm, I'm as sincere as a heart attack. I don't consider myself the best preacher on the planet. I know better than that. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. i got a call on my life, and I know I do. I know I do. I was there when God called me, like the old song says. I was there when it happened. And I guess I ought to know. Hallelujah. I was there when he called me. I was there when he used Dr. C.M. Ward, the, the, one of the greatest men in the history of the Pentecostal movement, to prophetically uh, confirm my calling to me in front of my pastor when I was 12 years old. I was there when... Uh, when uh, Nori Kogel, a man of God, prophesied over me and confirmed my calling by reason of a word of prophecy, I was there. I know there's a calling on my life, but you know what? There are a lot of people in our world today that have calling on their lives who are not living up to their callings, who are not pursuing what God has called them to do. It's too hard. It's too hard. Oh. I'm going to tell you, ministry is hard work. Anybody thinks ministry is anything less than hard work. You don't know anything about ministry. I don't know anybody on this planet except for, I'm going to say, genuine men and women of God who get done dirty as much, who get mistreated as much, who get 
lambasted as much, who get talked about as much, whose reputation and integrity people try to smear as much. I don't know people except for genuine men and women of God with a calling on their life who struggle as hard to do the right thing, even though they may not, and God knows I don't all the time do the right thing. But their desire is to do the right thing. Their heart is in it. They mean to do the right thing. It's hard work. It's hard work to hear from God week after week, month after month, year after year. So you have a message to bring to the church that comes from heaven and not just from your own imagination, not just from your own thinking, your own viewpoints and your own understanding of Scripture. There are times when life is dealing you a hard blow like we've been going through here as of late. I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. The last several weeks... It has been getting harder and harder for me to hear from heaven and get a word from the Lord for our Sunday message because there is so much going on that it's trying to crowd out my ability to, to get in the spirit and hewn in on what God is trying to speak to me so that I in turn can speak to the church. There are people out there that have calls on their lives and you know what? They're not trying to live up to their calling. They're not trying to obey the call of God in their life. They're like Jonah. They're going in their own direction in spite of God calling them in another direction. And this man, a Levite, walks past, but he gets close enough to look and to evaluate what's going on with this man who's been robbed and beaten and left for dead, but he still chooses to move along. Well, we know our neighbor is not someone who lives next to us because the whole story, the setting of the whole story is on a road between Jerusalem and Jericho. You might call it, in modern vernacular, a highway. So this is a road that people travel. This isn't a road people live on. This is a road people travel to get from destination A to destination B, to get from Jerusalem to Jericho. So we know a neighbor has nothing to do with proximity to our living quarters, number one. But then there comes a third man. And who would this third man be? Oh my goodness. A Samaritan. Oh. A societal outcast. You might call him a minority. You might call him a half-breed. You might call him one that doesn't fit into societal norms, one who's not accepted by the majority. Why, he could be a queer. He could be a gay lesbian person. He could be a person with alcohol issues. He could be a person with addiction issues. He could be a person who just can't seem to marry and stay married. He could have been married five, six, seven times and other people look at him like, what in the world's wrong with you? Why are you so broken? He's a Samaritan. Samaritans were not part of the Jewish community and they were not entirely part of the Gentile community. They kind of were in limbo, somewhere in between. They were looked down upon. They were not thought highly of. Yet in his story, who does Jesus use as the hero? Hero in the story, a Samaritan. <laughs> Don't you know, LGBT person, you can be the hero in your story? Hallelujah. Don't you know, minority person, you can be the hero in your story? Don't you know today that regardless of what society has to say or the church has to say about you, you can be the hero in your story? This Samaritan comes, and I'm trying to synopsize. I'm not, I'm not trying to drag it out today. And he does everything that is necessary to administer first aid and to bring this man to a safe place. 
And he provides every comfort he provides, every help he can possibly provide, even going so far as to tell the innkeeper, listen, I pass this way all the time, you know me. I'll be back, and when I come back, if this man staying here costs you any more than what I'm giving you now, I'll pay you the balance later. He did everything he could for this man. And you know what? It doesn't look like he was hanging around so they, this man could praise him or thank him or show his appreciation, did he? No, he left, but he said, I'll pay for anything this man should cost you to care for until he's better and well enough to get up and go. And the Lord asked the question, listen, which of these three men the question wasn't about the man who had been beaten the question wasn't about the man who had been robbed and left for dead the question was which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves So the Lord's question is, you're asking me, how do you identify your neighbor? I'm turning this around. And I'm asking you, who are you supposed to show yourself neighborly to? You hear what I'm telling you? Did the priest show himself neighborly? No. Did the Levite show himself neighborly? No. Well, which of these three did? present himself and carry himself like a neighbor. Oh my goodness, don't you see how Jesus turned that whole equation around? See, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Every time you come to God and you ask God how you can judge others and how you can classify others and how you can identify whether or not you should love others or you should treat others well, the Lord's going to turn that question around and say, listen, let me tell you a little secret. You can't do nothing about them. The only one you can do anything about is you. So why don't we just turn this thing around and have you look inward instead of outward. Let's have you look at yourself instead of looking at the guy next to you. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's what Jesus did in this parable. He turned the whole thing around and made this man have to look at himself. Your neighbor's not identified by whether or not they drink or smoke or do drugs. Your neighbor's not identified by whether they're gay, straight, or otherwise. Your neighbor's not identified whether they're part of your religion or not. Your neighbor's not identified whether they live close to you or they live within two houses of you or if they live on the same block as you. No. My question to you is this. Who do you show yourself neighborly toward? Well, Lord, wait a minute. You just turned that whole thing around on me. The Lord had ways of turning inquiries around and making the one asking the question look inward. So it was this day as the lawyer, an expert, an expert in the Hebrew law, cunningly asks the Lord about who should God's people acknowledge and treat as neighbors. After all, the scriptures command that we love our neighbors. This question was meant to look at the definition of neighbors from the perspective of the one who seeks to identify his neighbor. This question, according to the law, would be answered by examining the conduct of the other. But in his answer, Jesus turns the attention from looking at the other to looking inside one's own self. A neighbor, the Lord suggests, is not one who acts a certain way, belongs to a certain nationality, a certain group, a certain religion, a certain neighborhood, or lives by a certain moral or religious law or code, but rather by the way he lives. One who is a neighbor treats, listen to me, all others as 
a neighbor. You know, there's an old saying, if you want love, show love. It's an old song you say, darling, if you want me to be closer to you, get closer to me. Yeah, I know a little bit of popular music. I know a little bit of secular music. Tommy back there making faces because he knows I'm not a, a, a real secular music uh, expert. But, you know, there's an old, if, if you want people to treat you a certain way, then what you need to do is you need to treat them a certain way. If you want to know how to identify your neighbor, it's very simple. Treat everybody as your neighbor. If you treat everybody as your neighbor, guess what will happen? You'll never fail to love your neighbor. Why? Because you have not excluded anyone. See what the Lord did? See what he did? This man's trying to figure out who can I exclude from identifying as the neighbor. And Jesus turns the whole equation around and basically says, uh, Honey, it don't matter if you're traveling down a road and you're going from point A to point B and you don't live there. If there's somebody there that needs something, needs you to be a neighbor to him, then won't you be my neighbor? See, if we treat everyone with whom we come into contact as our neighbor, then it is impossible to fail the mandate of God's word to love your neighbor as yourself. How can you possibly fail to do that if you treat everyone as your neighbor? Ha ha! Simple answer, amen. That's a pretty simple answer, isn't it? The Word of God tells us in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, Jesus speaking, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is known as the golden rule. We often quote it, we, we we don't quote it. If we quoted it, we'd say exactly what I just read. But we often kind of paraphrase it by saying, Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Who is your neighbor? Everybody's your neighbor. Because God said, Whatever you would have people do to you, that's how you ought to do them. Would you want people to do to you what that priest did? Would you want people to do to you what that Levite did? Would you want people to do for you what that Samaritan did? Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Amen. Mm -hmm. So you see right there we understand line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Jesus turned that whole situation around and caused that man, instead of looking outward and trying to identify, okay, he would be my neighbor, he would not. He would be my neighbor, he would not. She would be my neighbor, she would not. You follow? He turned it around and caused that man to look inward and say, listen, everybody with whom you come into contact is your neighbor. Everybody. Because in the end, however you would want people to treat you, that's how you ought to treat them. My goodness, pretty simple, isn't it? Would you be my neighbor? It's always easy to justify not having to love someone when you look at them in terms of their conduct or their character. But when you understand that to have neighbors, listen to me now, you must first be a neighbor. You want good neighbors? Be a good neighbor. Suddenly, the standard changes and the goalposts are moved. Our neighbors today are not determined by who they are or by their qualities or their qualifications, but rather our neighbors are determined by ours. Ooh, boy, powerful, isn't it? How do I identify my neighbor? I identify my neighbor by the quality of my character. I, qualify, I identify my neighbor by the quality of my religion. I identify my neighbor by the quality of my spirituality. I identify my neighbor by the quality of my ability to love. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh my goodness, a whole lot of people are going to stand before God in the judgment and they will have failed the most important 
commandment of all. Love God with everything you've got and to love your neighbor as yourself. As children of God, all men are our neighbors. In the world, only those who live immediately near an individual is identified as a neighbor. But the standard of God's word is that all with whom we come into contact or all whom we might pass or see in this life is our neighbor. So a neighbor is not to be measured or judged by how they approach or how they treat us, but rather by how we approach and how we treat them. I've got one neighbor right here in this house. I won't say their name, I'll just point in their direction and whistle. The fella and I, the husband, they're retired folks. The husband and I get along marvelously. We talk all the time. He's very, very personable, very nice fella. His wife is the grumpiest old goat that ever walked planet Earth. Every time I turn around, if I mow one inch into their property line, she's having a fit. I mow my lawn lower than her husband mows his lawn, and they don't want their grass mowed that short. Well, if I happen to mow an extra inch or two, it's not killing the grass. It's not doing anything to their grass. It doesn't hurt their grass in the least. But every time I turn around, I kid you not, folks, every time that man comes over to me and I'm mowing my lawn, I'm just expecting him to be passing along one of her gripes because she constantly has something to gripe about. I get so aggravated. I, oh, I get so frustrated sometimes. I was on the mower yesterday and I was thinking and we got a privacy fence around our backyard and you know, they keep their garbage cans behind our privacy fence in the alley, behind our privacy fence. Well, now they've got a yard of their own. Why don't they keep that garbage can over on their side of the property line? Hello now. And... I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest. Little devil got on my shoulder and said, you know what, you ought to tell him. Bless God, you ought to tell him. You know, since property lines are so important to you folks, and since your wife just loses sleep over the property line being so meticulously guarded, why don't you keep your garbage cans on your side of our property line instead of on my side? Why should your garbage cans be behind my fence? you got a fence around your property. Put them behind your fence on your side. Oh, but he wants his yard to look pristine. He wants everything to look perfect. He don't want no garbage cans sitting there, you know, interrupting the beauty of how his property looks. So put his garbage cans behind me. And that thought went through my mind. And then the Spirit of God came along and said, No, because that's your neighbor. And your neighbor's not identified by how they treat you, but by how you treat them. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And I said, Would I want somebody to make such a fuss with me? Would I want? No, I wouldn't. You know, them garbage cans ain't hurting us a lick. They're not doing us any damage. It's not costing me nothing. It ain't doing nothing. Just leave things be. You be the better person. You have the higher quality character. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, that's what I'm talking about today. So a neighbor's not to be measured by how they approach us, but rather how we approach them. The Lord does not identify the wounded, robbed man as the one who qualified as a neighbor, but rather he identifies the one who showed mercy and ministered to that man as being neighborly. We look at others when you can do nothing to affect their behavior, you can do nothing to affect their character, or their conduct. We look at others. Why? Why? Look only at yourself. Treat all men as neighbors 
And you will not ever be guilty of disobeying the mandate of God to love your neighbor as yourself. So today I ask this simple question. Won't you be my neighbor? Amen. Pretty simple message, isn't it? Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?